Kings chapter 8, verse 10 to 19. We'll look at the entire chapter, in fact, but uh, just a, we'll read a selection of the passage we'll be looking into this morning. Let's read these uh, verses, <clears throat> passage of scripture, responsively, uh, in honor of God's word. Chapter 8, verse 10 to 19. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. So that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in, this, in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an excellent house, a place for you to dwell in forever. And the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build a house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build a house for my name. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, I believe uh, many people are, have been or are traveling to Europe at this time. Uh, in March, April, and May. I believe it is a good time to travel to uh, Europe, but don't miss church though, <laughs> still. A lot of people enjoy the uh, heritage, the history, and the churches there in Europe. Uh, church is uh, vitally is connected to the history of Europe. And I myself actually was traveling in Europe <clears throat> many years back ago. And uh, it was fun just watching all the different, different styles of the building of, of churches in Europe. But uh, uh, there are diversity in all the different uh, architecture and different times they were built in. But uh, there's commonalities, and I find two. Uh, first is that uh, inside the church building, usually the ceiling is really, really high. Uh, I believe it uh, is a message, a signal to signify uh, the greatness of God, to exalt Him. We cannot contain God in this building, but to express it in some human form, to say God is exalted, He is high, and He is to be worshipped. Another common architectural form we find in church buildings in Europe, and probably here as well in America, is that the, most of these churches have these uh, spires that are pointing to heaven. And uh, what is the meaning? Why do people build these spires, these sharp, pointy cones up to heaven? Well, I believe it is a, uh, our expression of faith, wanting to touch heaven, wanting to be connected to God. It's like a raised hand saying, God, I'm here. I want to touch you. Hear my prayers. It's probably all those combined in an architectural structure. And uh, these, we, we want to express our faith. We want to express our devotion and philosophy even in building structures. Um, sometimes when we uh, build something, we put our philosophy in the structure from the beginning. But other times, I also think that as we use the building of a church, that significance is actually laid upon the building as things happen. History goes on. And while I was in Germany, I visited a, a small city called Leipzig. And uh, this city was in former East Germany. And uh, there's a church called uh, St. Nicholas, St. Nikolai Kirche, a church. And uh, at this church, they have this beautiful architecture, long columns, uh, tall columns. And at the end of the column, you see these uh, palm branches uh, up on the ceiling. It's green. And this is not a modern church. It's, it dates way back to 
uh, Johann Saint, uh, Sebastian Bach's period. Bach used to play the organ. You see the organ at the back of the church? From this church. It's magnificent. It's a, a beautiful church. Not too big, but it's beautiful. But this building is not just famous for Bach, but it's more famous for a special Monday evening prayer meeting they used to have before the reunification. Young people of the city would come together for Monday evening prayer for peace every week. And they say this became the spark that ignited the revolution, the change that happened into, in the, that turned out to be the reunification of East and West Germany. As I visited this church and sat in the pew, I, I said a prayer to the Lord saying, God, would you bring unification between the two Koreas, South and North Korea, someday as you start your revival here, let your revival be started in the Korea Peninsula as well. We, have, we put significance in a building and there is philosophy, there is our life embedded in there. We want to, uh, the building is a way of conveying what we believe today to the next generation. And we see that all over in Europe. Today we want to talk about the first building that God, especially he initiated in human history. And we're talking none other than the, Sol the, the Temple of Solomon. God was the project manager and he was the initiator and he is the finisher of this amazing building. You know, we cannot <clears throat> see the temple of God in heaven. There is such a place in heaven as Hebrews talks about. And the true, the heavenly temple. We, nobody has seen that. But God has instructed Solomon to build, construct this building, this wonderful building project, a building. And it is a reflection of his philosophy, God's philosophy. And God's message is embedded in that building. As we investigate, as we uh, observe how the, the meaning of the temple of Solomon, the first temple of God, we get to understand what God's vision for us was and what the temple of God should function even today, the significance of this temple. The message this morning from the Gospel Project number eight is temple dedication. What is the significance of the Temple of Solomon? What is the significance of the Temple of Solomon? And what does that have to do with us this morning? I want to uh, <clears throat> talk about that from First Kings. Um, we look at the background from last week. We remember that Solomon was inaugurated. He was crowned the third king of the kingdom of Israel after Saul, after David, right? And uh, the first thing he did was he offered 1,000 sacrifices, worship, offering, worship to the Lord. And God responded by saying, what do you want? What's your wish? And we remember last week that Solomon requested one thing and one thing only. He said, God, give me discernment. Give me wisdom. Wisdom to save lives. Wisdom to, to govern this amazing people that you have entrusted to me. Well, after that prayer, you know, the kingdom business goes on. And the first project, the first uh, task that uh, he opened up and he was trying to accomplish was the building of the temple of God. If you look at the entire life of King Solomon, he reigned for 40 years. But among the 40 years, 20 of those years were spent building buildings. So for seven years, he dedicated his life to building the temple of God. The next 13 years, 13 years, he built his own house, his palace. I don't know how wild that is, you know, big, a, big, a bigger palace for himself and smaller. <laughs> no, just kidding. But uh, he spent half of his life on, the king, uh, on his throne building all these uh, building projects. And so this was a significant uh, event for, not only for Solomon, but for the entire kingdom of Israel. Because this project was something that was well overdue. The people of Israel have, have, been, uh, have been revealed to uh, of the, the, uh, the tabernacle of God. Even the wilderness, after they came out from Egypt, they were shown this temple of God in heaven. Moses was shown what it looked like. And, and so they were to build this tabernacle, this tent, where God's supposed to be showing up with them. But it was always uh, temporary. It was always uh, mobile. 
you know. And now they were yearning for this permanent place, this house of God where they could meet God. And this happens uh, with Solomon. If you look at chapter 5, it actually starts in chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, and on. Uh, God allows Solomon to build God a house. And he uses this inter interesting expression about God's house. In verse 5 of chapter 5, it's not on the screen, but in, in your Bibles, it says, uh, to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. And this phrase is repeated, for the name of the Lord of God. Build a house in my name. Build a house where it will say the, the house of Yahweh, the house of God, in my name. Name is very emphasized over and over again throughout the chapters as God is commanding Solomon to build this house. What does this mean that Solomon was to build a house in the name of God? You know, uh, in America, um, U.S., you know, is influential, in the, is influential in the world, and there are many embassies all over the, the world. And if you look at the embassies of all the countries, you could probably bet that the, the U.S. embassies are one of the most secure, most securest, and the most well-built uh, with the finest material and, and uh, a really safe place for the uh, Americans to, to do their business in a foreign country. Why? Because it has the name of U.S. Embassy on there. It represents U.S. in the nations. It re represents strength and power and security. So therefore, uh, a lot of money is invested in building up these uh, embassies all over the world because it represents uh, the country. When God asks, he commands Solomon to build a temple in his name. He's telling Solomon to build an embassy of heaven on this earth. It is supposed to represent something of God. It is supposed to represent uh, a place of God and the holiness of God. This was no small task. And so Solomon, in his wisdom, he asks his neighboring country, uh, the king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, Tyre. Uh, his name was Sidon. And he asked King Sidon, King Sidon, I know you have the best timber in the world, the timber of Lebanon. And would you provide me with this? Because God has commanded me to build him an awesome temple. And you, your workmanship is the best in the world. You have the best uh, you know, woodcutters. You have the best timbermen. And uh, I will send thousands, ten thousands, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of men to work with your men. And I also provide tens of thousands of people to transport these uh, lumber uh, from, from the, over the sea. And also I will provide tens of thousands of people to cut the stone from the, the mountain for the, king, <coughs> for the uh, sanctuary, the temple of God. And so with all these people, uh, and uh, they made a trade. They made a deal with the king of Sidon. And uh, he said, we will provide you with the food, with uh, all the necessities that, of your kingdom. Because you are a coastal country and we are a plain country. We can provide the food. And so Sidon says, you are wise. God has given David a wise son. And so they had good international relationship. And so after seven years, this temple was built by tens of thousands of men uh, and uh, they did, finished this work and pr there probably wasn't a sign on there but it had the name of God on this temple of God. And lastly, at the very last moment when people came to dedicate this temple, when people came to worship the Lord, there was a one last thing to be done in the temple. Just like you put a, a cherry on top of the ice cream uh, the Ark of the Covenant was to go into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place of the temple. And so the priests, they put the tabernacle, the, uh, the covenant, uh, Ark of the Covenant, inside the temple where people cannot see. And as, w as the priest was coming out, something happened. And that's where we pick up the verse that we read this morning, verse 10 of chapter 8. And it reads, And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. Suddenly, a supernatural cloud was in their midst, and they could not see clearly as we do now. 
This was reminiscent of something that they had heard about before. It had also heard, happened before when, when the people of Israel were were exiting out of Egypt and they came to the mountain of God and they made the tabernacle of God. And when they were worshiping God, there was the cloud, there was the fire visible in their midst. And, and this reminded Solomon of that those days. It, this reminded the people of God of those days and they realized what had happened. Solomon, in his wisdom, knew the significance of this temple and what, 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 how God was expressing the significance to his people. It, it meant one thing, actually. One thing and one thing only. It was that the presence of God was with them. In verse, 10, verse 12, it says, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. Solomon is referring to the older days, before days, past days, saying that before God dwelt in, in hidden curtain behind this black, you know, darkness. So we had no understanding of what his will for us was, who he really was, what kind of personality he had. But this temple makes all the difference now. It's night and day difference now. This presence of God will be with us from now on. And, and so Solomon was excited about this work of God, the message of God. He understood what God was saying to them. And verse 13, he says it very plainly. This will be a place for you to dwell in forever. Saying, God, this is where you will dwell with us now. And you've promised this. And you've shown this to us through this thick cloud, this presence of God. And they were honored. Think about it. They have, they have only heard about this event back in history hundreds of years ago. When it, that was before their eyes, their temple, and God was there. God, they sensed it with all their senses. How excited they was, must have been. How afraid they must have been. How thankful and gracious they must have been. And so Solomon goes on to explain. Maybe he was praising God for all, how all this came about to be from the time of Israel, from the Exodus. How God, and, and from then on, how he chose David. How he chose Solomon, his son, for this amazing project. And so that's the passage that we read this morning. But what is the significance of this temple of God for us? You know, again, in a nutshell, we can say the significance of the temple is heaven on earth. Uh, as I said, the best, uh, you know, for me, illustration is uh, embassy of heaven. God's representation, a manifestation upon this earth. A new way was opened. He's no longer in darkness, but now we are able to see him. We're able to hear him. We're able to go to him. A temple was a place that we could experience God. It was a place that we could talk to God. The question is this. The next question is this. But what does that mean for us today? Do we experience this temple? Where is the temple of God, by the way? Oh, the Sol Solomon's temple was in Jerusalem. So if we go to Jerusalem, what is there today? Is there a temple? No, you will see this, this big mosque there. And people, uh, all religions, like all major three religions, claim that place as holy place. They say this is the mosque where a prophet of Muhammad, he, uh, he did his work. And Judas, Judaism, they would say that, you know, this is where Solomon's temple used to be. And Christians would say, you know, this is where David, who is foreshadowed of Jesus, he, built, uh, he offered his son to, to build the temple. And then the second temple later on. But where is the temple? There is no temple today. In fact, God destroyed the temple. How is this message significant for us then, to us? We understand that temple of God is not a place, a physical place that we meet God, but it is a place where we experience the presence of God. That was the essence of this, the, the significance of the temple of God shown in Solomon's Days. The, the temple system uh, is, is done with when Jesus Christ was revealed and he did his salvific work on this earth. The, it was a, uh, a, a, a call of ending. It was the termination of 
the people of God, the Israelites, namely the Israelites, gathering around the temple of God. It was the termination of that period. With that termination, that the building of the temple of God also was terminated. But those who believe in Jesus Christ, God has uh, initiated another system called the church. And the church is the new temple of God. So what we see here in the Old Testament about the temple of God also applies to the new temple of God, the church. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 to 22. Can we read this together on the screen? Let's read it uh, there for us. Go. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It says, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Oh, that's our church name. He is the centerpiece of this church. And we're all joined in doing together, the members, you and I, are joined together into a holy temple where God dwells. Where is that place? Again, the church. The church is the dwelling place of God. The church is where the presence of God is experienced, it's felt, and it's in enjoyed. The Bible tells us that we, you and I, this church is the temple of God. It is the place where the Holy Spirit works. It is the place where the Holy Spirit touches us. The Old Testament function of the temple of God is exactly reflected here at the church of God. The next question may be a more important one. What is the presence of God then, really? And frankly, not just in holy terms, but what is the presence of of God. It is, is it some mysterious experience in your heart when you worship the Lord here today, this morning, or at night? Is it a, a, a spiritual encounter, special encounter with God? Maybe yes, maybe not. But one thing is for sure, we do not experience this cloud when we worship the Lord. If that were true, I mean, we're not worshiping the Lord. Then God doesn't like us. <laughs> Obviously, he's left us then. It's never been like that. Even from the New Testament time, we have no record of any cloud falling upon the people of God as they worship. Does that mean that the presence of God is gone from this New Testament times? Maybe the other way around. Maybe God does not show himself in the form of cloud anymore. It's never been like that from the New Testament period. But however, we still experience the presence of God in our worship service. Let me explain. As we hear the truth of the Word of God, and it touches us, and it, we come to a recognition, a realization of what the meaning of my life is. Holy Spirit is encountering, you are encountering the Holy Spirit. When you are praying, and you are praying an impossible prayer, and we are all self-seeking, we only pray for our own flesh, we pray for our kin, our family, but when we find ourselves praying for my neighbor, we find ourselves praying for our community, for the world, and for our missionaries, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is crafting, is, is uh, empowering our prayer to pray something that we usually do not pray for. That, my friends, is when the Holy Spirit encounters us. That, my friends, is when we experience the presence of God. Not only inside the church worship setting, we experience God during the week as well. As the church, you and I pray for something, you know, important something, a request to God. And we see that answered. We see only that God can do something and, and God is the one who makes it happen, we, when we realize that, we give glory to God saying, God, I experience you right now. You are here. I have not known it, but you are working on, in my midst. And I thank you and we praise you. We experience God. We encounter God. I probably have shared with you before many times uh, this year, but uh, you know, uh, our mission department has been praying for direction for our church since last year. Uh, where shall we go? What, what shall we do? And God sent uh, missionary Daniel Cho here in the pulpit and his wife to speak to us and to ask for help. 
I believe it, it was a calling from God. Uh, there are, there's much work to do among the leadership, leaders, spiritual leaders in Guatemala, and many work to be, much work to be done in the, uh, for the children and the women there as well. We hear this as the calling of God, and, and since January of this year to this, this point on, we find people of God giving themselves for the work of God. Again, we only live for ourselves. That is our default nature. That is our fleshy nature. But to see people giving themselves to the work of God, I see God there. And as I see our cornerstone church not only just going, but also giving their money, giving up their money, thousands of dollars, and praying uh, with their time for this mission of God, who people they've never seen before, I see God in our midst, the presence of of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit still works. He still is in our midst as we gather as church. But don't get me wrong, I'm not just talking about missions. It's, the missions is not the only thing that we experience the presence of God. Like I said before, whenever we see a person or you're, even yourself dedicating oneself to live for the Lord, Live for somebody else than you and your family. Whenever we see that happen, we experience the, the presence of God, that God is there. God is sighted at that time. Maybe after Sunday worship, there's a change of heart in your life. Maybe after your Bible study or a small group gathering, a cell group meeting, whatever, you are saying things that you would not normally say. You will see people change in a way that you did not expect. And those moments, my friends, are those when, and when, when the presence of God is dearly felt. Just like the, the passage that we read in Ephesians says, even today, we feel, the, we house the experience of God in our church. Uh, just like this passage says. But the important thing is this. Do you see? Do you experience the Holy Spirit in your life? In your everyday life? Is he relevant to you? That is the ultimate question that really bothers us, right? You know, um, thank you, Brother Jesus, for praying for our team that goes out to Palo Alto train station and shares the word. Uh, you know, Brother, you and I went yesterday, and uh, uh, God, we had a holy encounter. There was this uh, two Chinese ladies. They spoke English, but, you know, uh, when, when Brother, you started to speak in Chinese, their heart were like opened up and they were like all chattering. And I did not understand anything that they were saying, but I was praying for them. I didn't understand one thing. Shangdi. Right? Shangdi is God. <laughs> I'm probably saying like wrong right now. <laughs> you know, God this and God that and Hankook, you know, Korean. I understood that part, but everything else I didn't understand. I pray for them. And uh, at, the, at the end, you know, Brother you shared the gospel with these ladies. And at the end, I, uh, I, I said in, in English, you know, we do not know God. God is veiled. You know, it's darkness. But God has shown us through the Word of God. And so when we learn this Word of God, we get to understand the thing that you are truly seeking after. And not only that, when you come to church, church is where this is lived out. Holy Spirit lives this out in, our, in us and we get to experience God. So uh, we invited them to this worship, 10 o'clock. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're praying that they'll come uh, maybe next week. But uh, people want to encounter God. Even people out there who has never heard about the gospel, they know there is a higher being. They know there is somebody, an uh, ultimate power that has control over all things. And they want to be connected to him. They want to feel and see the presence of God. And where would they find this presence except for in the church, in the temple of God? Brothers and sisters, if God is going to show his presence in our church, let us, you and I, seek this presence of God in the church. Let's expect God to show up in your life. Heaven is for those who are hungry, Jesus says, in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Are you hungry for God? Or do you seek after, do you thirst after the presence of God? Those who seek, ask and knock will receive, Jesus says. We are praying that we want to be led by the Spirit 
for us to be led by this. We need to see the Spirit working in our lives. We need to experience the work in our, in, of the Spirit in our lives. Let us seek, let us pray that God, would you show me your Spirit, the presence of the Spirit that you promised at Cornerstone Church. Would you show me that so I could be led by the Spirit each day? I want to live out that temple function that you promised to us. Let that be our prayer this morning. The second significance of the temple of God. The first is, temple of God is filled with the presence of God, and we want to seek after that presence. The second one is that the temple of God is filled with prayers of the saint. As we go to the next phase of the Solomon's temple of dedication, the temple of dedication, he um, is lifting up another prayer to our Lord. So. The first part, he is explaining to people what's going on, and you know we are experiencing the presence of God. Now he's raising his hands up to heaven and to the people, and he's dedicating this temple for a very important function. From verse 22 of uh, chapter 8 that we haven't read. And in Solomon, he again reiterates well, how God has blessed his, son, his father David and how he is uh, experiencing God right now. But the next question comes, so what? What's the function of the presence of God? Why do we experience this presence? So what? God, what do you want us to do? So Solomon talks about this in his dedication. Look at verse 29 with me in chapter 8. Verse 29, it's probably on the screen, I think. It says, as he dedicates the temple, he says, Solomon says, that your eyes, God's eyes, may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. Verse 30, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place, and listen in in heaven, your dwelling place, and you, when, when you hear, forgive. Solomon is saying, would you listen to us as we pray in this house, as we face this house, wherever I might be, wherever my people might be, as we pray before this house, would you listen to me? You know, all of us probably, you know, I'm guessing you have smartphones, right? And throughout the day, many multiple times a day, you look at your phone, or oh, are there any messages, notifications, you know, any mails, any uh, voice messages, or phone calls? You check daily, multiple times, tens, hundreds of times a day. And in fact, this is what Solomon is saying to God. God, would you look at your notifications in this temple? When, when prayer is heaped, heaped up in this temple, when we lift up our voice and pray to you and send you all these messages, God, would you always look at this temple and, and check your notifications, what the prayers are? Would you keep on monitoring this temple? Would you bless us with that favor? Solomon is saying that this will be a place where you hear us where you listen to us and answer our prayers. But what was the content of the prayer? He was very specific. In verse 30, again, it says, And listen in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, he says, forgive. Wow, we didn't expect that. <laughs> forgive. Why talk about forgive, forgiveness? Well, the thing is, because our lives need forgiving. Our not lives are broken. We've messed it up. We, God has blessed us with so many good things in our life. So many, uh, so much uh, opportunities, health, wealth, families, environment. God has blessed us in many ways. But when we realize with brokenness that we've messed it up, we've messed our relationships up in our personal greed. We messed our bodies up as we abuse it, uh, with, we misuse it. As we commit violence to another brother, not only through neighbors, with neighbors, but as countries or communities, as we violate each other in wars and conflict, God, would you forgive us? Would you hear our prayers of, and, and forgive us? Would you heal our land? Would you renew and restore us, God? 
as our prayers are offered in this temple. Solomon is saying that the function of the temple of God is a place of prayer and a place of restoration. And as we read on in verse 31 and on, it talks about very specific examples. 31, when a person uh, commits a crime against their neighbor. 33, when Israel commits sin against you, God, and they are um, defeated. So it's uh, some kind of war, right? Verse 35, when the people of God, they commit uh, sin, and there is drought. So natural disaster. 33, uh, there is famine in the land. There is uh, pestilence. So there is, you know, environmental hazard here. 40, verse 44, when there is a war. So we're talking about all the situations when our relationships are broken, messed up. We break, we d destroy our environment. We have conflict in nations and countries because of our greed, because of our sin. God, would you forgive us? When we pray to God, saying not only for our families and our friends, and, but, but for this community, for the country, God, we have sinned. We are in conflict. We need forgiveness. When we pray that, it is an act of humility saying, God, I have, we have created all the problems, but the answer is only you, God. God, we pray to you because you hold the key to all our life problems. And God, let the temple of God be a place like that, where we pray to God and, and God answers, and God forgives. Brothers and sisters, who would pray for the world? Who would pray except for those who bear the name of God? Every year uh, in May, um, the first week of May, Thursday of first week of May, uh, the U.S. Constitution has, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, made that, that day as National Day of Prayer. And so it happened this past Thursday as well. And uh, we find Many leaders, you know, political, spiritual leaders, gather in Washington, D.C., uh, even in the Rose Garden of the president's home, and uh, they pray for the government, they pray for the United States of America. What do you hear? What is the message that you're hearing from such a day? Why is there such a day? You see, even the people who don't trust God, who don't have faith like you and I do in our Lord Jesus Christ, they have to admit that there are problems, issues in our lives that politics cannot solve. There are issues in our lives that economy, economists does, cannot solve. Businesses cannot solve these problems. Education, with all our science and medicine, it, this, these issues cannot be solved. They recognize that no military might can solve particular issues. And they realize the only sure hope, only answer comes not from these institution, humanly devised, crafted, organizations, but it comes from God. And therefore, the founding fathers of the country said, in God we trust. And they instituted a de national day of prayer. What do you hear from this calling from the world? They're calling us, they're asking us, you and I, Christians, who bear the name of Jesus Christ, who are called Christians, who follow Christ, who can call out to God in the name of Jesus Christ. They're asking us, would you pray for our country? Would you pray for this crisis? We need healing in this land. We need forgiveness in this country. Would you, Christians who are called in the name of God, would you pray for us? And this is exactly what God said the function of the temple of God would do. Would you read with me 2 Corinthians Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 on the screen? Let's read it together. It's a famous verse. Ready, go. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. After Solomon dedicates this prayer, this temple to God, God responds. Just like when Solomon was inaugurated, God shows up in a dream. God shows up a second time to Solomon. And this is what he says. God says this, if my people who are called by my name, if Christians who are called by the name of Jesus Christ will humble themselves and pray because we are the temple of God, God promises, I will turn my face. 
I will, I will turn to their, uh, I'm sorry, God, if we seek his face, if we turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear us and he will forgive us and heal our land. Brothers and sisters, we have a tremendous responsibility as the temple of God. We see this reflected from the first temple, God's philosophy in this temple. If we do not pray for our leaders, our political leaders, our economic leaders, our educational leaders, if we do not pray for this land, if for the suffering, the violence we see each day, who will pray for, for them? Who will pray for the healing of this land? Perhaps God is calling us out to pray for these people. When we pray for them in the name of Jesus Christ, I know, I know I trust that God will heal this land. That is why we need to pray for the people of Venezuela who have so much wealth but living in so much poverty and pain and oppression. Little freedom. Who will pray for those people of God? That's why we need to pray for those people affected by the terrorists who killed people at the synagogue over the Passover weekend. That's why we pray for those people at Christ Church in New Zealand, the Muslims who have been violated. We need to pray for their comfort and for life. We also need to pray for those people in Sri Lanka who were attacked brutally and killed on Easter Sunday as they worshiped the Lord. Who will pray for them? Who will pray for that country? God is calling us, you and me, the temple of God, to pray in the name of God for their forgiveness, for our forgiveness. And as the scripture says, exactly as the scripture says, he will hear you and our, my prayer in heaven and will forgive their sin and their land. Let us not neglect this important duty that God has given us as temple of God, but commit to pray not only for our flesh and blood and, and kin, but pray for those who are asking all of us to pray, even on a national day of prayer. Let us proclaim a national day of prayer in our hearts and pray for those people that God loves so much. Let's pray.